Um, today I'm presenting a paper from my dissertation that analyzes how frontline workers in food service and retail industries conceptualize their customers. So since the 1970s, the US economy has seen two interrelated transitions. First, there's been a notable decline in the manufacturing sector as the United States has transitioned to a service economy. In this transition, however, we've also seen job quality polarization with a proliferation of good jobs among managers and professionals and bad jobs among service workers. Frontline food service and retail jobs make up some of the most common bad jobs in the United States, employing over 15 million people as of May 2019. So these frontline jobs are known for their low wages and lack of benefits, as well as for their precarity. These workers often can't get full-time work with employers sometimes keeping them just a few hours out of reach so they don't qualify for benefits. In addition, their schedules are unpredictable. They don't know how many hours in advance they'll be working or when their hours might be. And their schedules are undesirable, often working on nights and weekends, holidays, when others might be spending time with friends or family. Turning to customers, the assumption is that for these low-wage frontline workers, customers present another obstacle to a good job. Customer service interactions are thought to be emotionally draining, forcing workers to put on a happy face, even when dealing with rude customers. The impact of customers in these jobs has been a particular interest during the pandemic. So on the one hand, workers might be worse off due to negative interactions surrounding masks. They could also be worried about customers making them sick. But on the other hand, the designation of many frontline workers as essential workers has led to an outpouring of gratitude. Workers at Target and Walmart are now being described as heroes and mentioned in the same sentences as nurses and doctors. So how do we expect frontline workers to make sense of this gratitude? Does it impact subjective job quality at all? This talk isn't about COVID, but I think the case presses the issue. For these low-wage frontline workers, what should we make of positive interactions with customers? Could workers be finding meaning in customer service interactions rather than seeing them purely as an emotional drain? This tension between the positive and negative aspects of customer service work for frontline food service and retail workers is the subject of my talk today. So I look systematically at workers employed by 10 different food service and retail companies, and I analyze the way that workers incorporate their customers into job quality evaluations using evidence from Glassdoor.com, a website where workers post anonymous reviews of their jobs. I then build a machine learning model to code Glassdoor comments for different ways of discussing customer interactions and analyze how these different differences are associated with job ratings on Glassdoor. And then finally, I conduct an original survey of workers at these companies asking attitudinal questions about how workers see their customers. So a little literature, what does it tell us about how frontline workers might interpret their interactions with customers? The anchoring theoretical tool we use to make sense of customer service interactions was put forward in the managed heart. And it postulated argues that service work presents a new form of labor, emotional labor. Service jobs require the display of emotions to meet the requirements of a job. And a Hochschild breaks this down into different types of acting that workers might engage in. On the one hand, workers may engage in service acting where workers must act in a way they do not feel. And here the cognitive dissonance can be emotionally exhausting. But on the other hand, workers might end up trying to change their own emotions to match the emotions required of them by the job. Hoshchio calls this deep acting and argues that it can lead workers to experience alienation in a new way. By reconfiguring your own emotions to meet the needs of your employer, Hoshchio argues you become alienated from yourself. Hoshchio expects there is a distribution of occupations which might require more emotional labor than others. And this will correspond to the need for alienating deep acting or more emotionally exhausting surface acting. For low-wage frontline workers, research has focused specifically on surface acting, tying the process of acting in a way that is separate from how you truly feel to job satisfaction and other outcomes. The assumption is here is that the nature of low-wage frontline service work where the tasks are simple and short don't require workers to engage in deep acting. So workers are not forced to try and trick themselves into uh, feeling positively towards their customers. These concepts of emotional labor and service acting have guided researchers to study the impact of emotional regulation 
acting and in inauthenticity on subjective job quality and well-being. Now, there's ample evidence demonstrating the negative impact of surface acting on frontline workers. Micro-level research has identified how negative interactions with customers can play an outsized role for workers, impacting the rest of their day and even their well-being days after the incident. Other research has focused on how workers with certain personality characteristics are more suited to deal with negative interactions with customers. These workers are more satisfied with their jobs and less emotionally drained as a result of surface acting. Researchers have also studied occupational variation, identifying how the surface acting requirements of different jobs impact job quality. More surface acting is correlated with lower job satisfaction. However, a critique of the emotional labor approach has emerged in research on healthcare. For nurses, service interactions are thought to be notably rewarding. Nurses and doctors interact with patients in the process of saving lives. So here we might reasonably expect healthcare workers to see the patient, these patient interactions as an intrinsically rewarding and satisfying part of the job. Updating the emotional labor framework, researchers point out that organizational strategies are key here in order to flip the script and allow nurses to find meaning and intrinsic value in their interactions with patients, organizations must employ specific strategies. For instance, managers can create settings where nurses can debrief, almost in a sort of group therapy session, in order to reinvigorate nurses who may be dealing with difficult or emotionally draining interactions with patients. In addition, organizations can configure feeling rules or the required emotional displays for workers in order to produce an environment that allows for emotional connection with patients rather than surface acting. Also, messaging from the organization can lead workers to realign how they see their interactions with patients. Though this is a complicated process requiring reinforcement from managers and coworkers, it may still produce feelings of inauthenticity. Importantly, these studies all take place within the healthcare industry, where the intrinsic value of the work can be easily recognized, and resources to say stop and debrief as a group may be more readily available than in the bad jobs of the service industry. So while the operating assumption is that low-wage frontline workers won't find meaning in their interactions with customers, some qualitative research has found the opposite. In the study of grocery store workers, Tolich argues that this work can be liberating. While workers do experience stressful and negative interactions with customers, Tolich finds that these workers often describe their interactions as the most pleasurable and satisfying moments of their day. Other researcher has found similar anomalies. For instance, although we would expect the short-term nature of these service interactions to preclude the development of meaningful relationships, Walmart workers talk about their regular customers and describe the satisfaction their regulars bring to their jobs. From the opposite perspective, customers can be worse than a source of stress. Repeated bad customer service interactions can make workers feel like a failure, impacting their self-worth their self-worth and uh, causing them to quit their jobs. There is some evidence that organizational strategies play a role in defining the customer service experience for low-wage workers. Hushchild herself talks about how configurations of feeling rules might make things worse, for instance, by forcing grocery store workers to happily greet customers. Uh, for Tolich's study of grocery store workers, the extent of the emotional display rules in the supermarket can impact how alienating or liberating the work can be. Even studies that see customer interactions as just a stressful source of surface acting describe how a supportive environment for instance, in terms of the supportive network of coworkers can buffer the negative impact of emotional labor. While some research has focused specifically on, oh, I think I, uh, yeah, all right. So um, I study frontline food service and retail jobs as a site to better understand customer service, uh, specifically because it's not a special case. It's not special first because there are some of the most, these are some of the most common customer service jobs there are, but also in another important way. In the literature, we have strategically chosen to study occupations where intense emotional labor is occurring. Postfield study stewardesses since they're supposed to be unnaturally nice and many have studied healthcare workers. Oh, is this true that we, you can't see my slides? 
Uh, yeah, so sorry. I, I was under the impression you were sort of introducing your presentation and then about to go to slides, but then it was getting to a point where I realized that. Oh, you no. Have... So you were showing your slides. Oh, you see the slides? I see my slides moving here. You see, you see them. Adam sees them. Do other people? Oh, people, see oh, people slides, see them. I don't see. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we're all seeing it. I was. Uh... <laughs> Interesting. I learned something about Zoom just now. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. You're uh, you're you're perfectly in the fine. I apparently I I have the ability as uh, the host to toggle between your screen and your slides. Oh, uh, okay. Anyways, please continue. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So this customer service interactions. You know, there are some of the most common jobs, but these interactions are also not emotionally laborious in the same way. So workers are likely not doing the extra work of deep acting required in other occupations to try and empathize with their customers. So there's likely to be more of this tiring surface acting. Uh, and the work itself is not supposed to carry the same meaning as in healthcare. So workers have no reason to find their customer interactions to be intrinsically satisfying. Uh, moreover, in these bad jobs where companies are focused on keeping the labor costs low, we might not see this debriefing or managerial support happening. And as a result, I think the expectation should be clear. These workers should not be finding deep meaning in their interactions with customers. These interactions really should be draining, but the research is mixed. While some studies find that workers in these jobs are less satisfied, other researchers suggest that interactions with customers can be satisfying, even liberating. If this is the case, how can we make sense of it from an emotional labor framework? So in trying to answer this question, yeah, in trying to answer this question, it's essential to take organizational variation into account since research suggests it could be uh, the defining factor in determining whether workers find meaning in their interactions or make a bad job better. Studying a single organization might leave us with a biased view of the impact of customers on workers, but accounting for organizational variation is difficult. Studies that identify variation along these lines often take the form of relatively small end studies of a single organization. These projects are extremely informative, but they also are extremely labor intensive, making it difficult to say something definitive about the extent to which workers in any one occupation typically find meaning in their interactions with customers. So I approach this question instead by studying workers' job evaluations on glassdoor.com. Glassdoor is a website where workers can anonymously post a review of their job. The review includes a title as well as written pros and cons section. In addition, workers can optionally include whether they're a current or former employee, uh, their location, whether they're a full or part-time employee and their tenure. In addition to giving an overall rating, workers also post ratings of different aspects of the job such as compensation and benefits, work-life balance, and career opportunities. But for today, I am just focusing on the main review. There are some drawbacks to using Glassdoor as a data source. First, it's not a random sample, so we don't have a good idea of how reviewers find the site and what leads them to post. They could be angrier than the average worker or have a different, different distribution of job quality concerns. The one thing I'll say here is that surprisingly, like the average review is uh, three out of five here. And uh, when you look at a histogram, it's really not these bimodal ones and fives. Uh, in addition, reviewers may also be dishonest. Though given the level of anonymity, specifically at these large employers, there's little incentive to post something untrue. Uh, most importantly, Glassdoor lacks demographic data. Because the reviews are anonymous, there's no indication of a worker's age, race, or gender. And this is unfortunate since we would expect, for instance, that these customer interactions are racialized and gendered. Experiences with racist and sexist customers may make it harder to see the bright side of service work. However, there are also a number of benefits, I think, to using this data set, particularly to address current questions in the literature. So first, there are these quantitative and also these qualitative responses. And since there's a free text portion, we get a window into what workers think about when they evaluate their jobs. The Glassdoor data allows me as a researcher to take a really hands-off approach 
taking workers at their word regarding how they incorporate customers into their job evaluations. If workers see customers in different ways than the theory predicts, the data source can provide this kind of evidence. In addition, in addition this data is useful because it is employer identified and voluminous. So the ability to analyze thousands of job reviews from different companies with stores all over the United States provides a new and powerful way to analyze questions that we are typically only able to take up in case studies. Sampling over establishments and organizations gives us a sense of how, in general, low-wage frontline workers are thinking about their interactions with customers. So I scrape reviews from Glassdoor beginning when the website started in 2008 to 2018. I sample reviews for 10 food service and retail companies with uh, five industries in total and, five, and two companies per industry. And the sampling strategy is meant to capture industry variation in tasks and also to account for any organizational variation and how customer service interactions are managed. I scraped over 150,000 reviews, but included in my initial analysis sample the 60,000 reviews were all optional identifying information, such as location and tenure as provided. And I analyzed the data using a three-step methodological approach. First, I conduct a qualitative analysis of job evaluations that mention customers and produce an inductive scheme of the different ways that workers bring customers into how they talk about their jobs, grouping these into different orientations towards customers. Second, I consider the relative impact of these different views, analyzing how different orientations towards customers stack up against one another in terms of quantitative ratings of the job. And then finally, in a survey, I ask workers directly about the attitudes implied by these orientations and correlate these with job satisfaction and plans to look for a new job. So of the 60,000 reviews that could be included in my analysis, 15,000 mentioned customers or a variant of the word in the pros or cons section. And right off the bat, there's an outcome which is kind of surprising from the surface acting perspective. Roughly half of the reviews mention customers in the pros. And this is suggestive that workers may be enjoying some aspect of their interactions with customers. Digging down, I sample 500 pros reviews and 500 cons reviews to identify differences in how workers write about their customers in these job evaluations. So to analyze these reviews, I develop an inductive coding scheme, starting with over 100 codes and ending up with six distinct ways that workers talk about their customers. And I categorize these into three orientations that I'm going to talk about here. So the first set of comments uh, I'm laying out for you is what I think most closely relates to our expectations from a surface acting or emotional labor perspective. So here workers discuss their negative interactions with customers on a surface level. They are focused on the characteristics of the customers themselves and the emotional toll it takes on them. So dealing with terrible customers, some customers make messes and are, some, and are so rude. And I'm calling this an occupational hazard since these reviews um, are kind of say that these types of interactions are to be expected in service work. So let me see. Yeah, some people write, putting on your overly happy face all the time can be tiring. Some customers need to be brought down to earth and some customers can be really demanding and needy, but that's true for all, all sort of customer service jobs. And so they typically think of this as an aspect of the job and they blame negative interactions mostly on the customer themselves. But on the other hand, here we return to our initial surprise. Many workers see customers as a benefit rather than as a downside. Here it's the positive interactions with customers which stand out for these workers. So interactions with customers or I love my interactions with customers, they always kept a smile on my face. I'm calling this an occupational benefit orientation and I'm including it as part of this overall occupational orientation where workers see negative or positive interactions as kind of a characteristic of service work as a whole. But positive reviews go deeper than that. In line with studies of nurses and some research on low-wage frontline workers, 
some workers do indeed find deep meaning in their interactions with customers. So this worker writes, I loved working in an environment where people told me that I made their day better just by being cheerful. It's also quite enjoyable to make things like ice cream cones, not because it's a complicated task, but because you made something for someone who thinks it's to enjoy what you made for them. And this worker is really describing an emotion that we typically reserve for healthcare workers. These workers are feeling good about themselves and their jobs because they feel like they're helping people. Additionally, we do see evidence for a deeper appreciation of these long-term relationships, even in the context of these short-term interactions. So a CVS worker writes, customers are like family to us. Again, for these workers, service acting is not the takeaway of customer service. It's a positive feeling associated with helping someone or satisfaction in the relationship that workers develop. And I'm calling both of these together in intrinsic value orientation. Finally, part of what this intrinsic value orientation suggests is that workers are concerned about the well being of their customers. Uh, the last set of reviews I'm showing you here identify an organizational orientation where workers explicitly invoke organizational characteristics that help or hamper customer service. For those who see their organization as supportive, part of what this means is that they're given the ability to help customers. So you have the power to do what you feel is necessary to please the customer. This also shows up as coworkers wanting to do a good job. So most employees have a genuine want to be part of an outstanding customer service experience. And some of these reviews go beyond a discussion of the customer service interaction to simply how customers are treated by the organization more broadly. So a strong company focus on keeping prices down to save customers money, for instance. Here we see organizational support, mostly meaning that the company makes a genuine effort to provide a good customer experience. Workers here are explicitly concerned with these organizational strategies, even beyond feeling rules and their impact on customers. However, we also see the flip side of this with an unsupportive organization. And here's a quote that seems like it could be taken out of a sociology textbook. So the customer service, taking care of our people culture that we had all grown up with disappeared. And its place was a culture of making a number just for the sake of making a number. In addition to the stores being grossly understaffed as voiced not only by our managers, but also by our customers, the company has made it extremely difficult to order the product that is needed to take care of the customers. And so here the critique is not with the customers, but how the company has wronged the customers. And another review states, um, often we were understaffed and there would be a line at the door. This was stressful because then the customers would become personally upset with you, even when you were working your hardest. And here again, we see a focus on negative interactions, but this time the worker explicitly draws a line between organizational decision-making and these negative interactions. So I'll leave the counts of different codes I found up here for you, but to sum up what I'm finding, some workers report what we would expect from surface acting, having to deal with rude customers is a pain. However, some workers find focus on the positives instead of the negatives, and others go even deeper, expressing intrinsic value in these interactions, something that's typically reserved for other occupations. And finally, workers with this organizational orientation present a concern for how the customer service experience is managed. These workers are focused on the organization's ability to take care of its customers along with its workers. Uh, great. So moving on from here, I'm taking two approaches. First, we know that workers express these different or orientations, but we don't know if these different orientations really matter for how workers rate their jobs. So to address this, I continue to use the glass door data to analyze whether an organizational orientation is associated with more extreme glass door ratings than an occupational orientation. And second, I examine a set of attitudes that are implied by the orientations in the original survey targeted at the same set of 10 employers. So to analyze these orientations um, and compare to one another in intensity of job ratings, I use computational text analysis. The idea here is that I label the subset of the data for whether they indicate an occupational or organizational orientation for the data. And then using this labeled data, I can train a machine learning model 
to code the remaining 14,000 reviews that mention customers. So I'm going to try and kind of give a top level explanation of how I'm doing this, but I think I might end up giving too much detail to some and not enough to others. So, you know, bear with me here. So the simplest way to build a model would be to use a bag of words regression, where there would be a column for each word in the data set, as well as a one or a zero for the organizational label. And each row would include a count of how many times the word was used in a specific last row review. This way, I would just conduct a logistic regression with a really big matrix, but this has some issues. Uh, first, this produces a sparse matrix, which can make it difficult to run a regression, especially when there are more words in corpus than observations. Second, a bag of words model drops the context of the words being used, which could contain important information. And finally, some words might be used interchangeably like customer and guest, and these models kind of leave out this information. There are more complex machine learning models uh, to provide a way to take into account many of these problems, which I'm going to try and quickly explain at a pretty high level. So the models draw upon word embeddings, where each word in the corpus is associated with a vector of numbers, and words that are used in a similar way have a similar set of numbers associated with them. Word embeddings reduce dimensionality in models while also preserving some meaning in how the words are used. Uh, there are some commonly used pre-trained embeddings built on text from the internet or various other sources, but you can also build your own from your own embeddings based on, build your own embeddings from your own corpus of text. And there are different ways of doing this. You can use skip grams or a continuous back of words model. Uh, in skip grams, a machine learning model iterates over each word in its last drawer review and attempts to use that word to predict its neighbors. In a continuous bag of words model, uh, it attempts to predict the current word using the words around it. So to, to determine which word embeddings would be best for my model, my model, I look to see what words are similar to keywords in embedding space or the closest words based on the numbers in the word embeddings. I consider embeddings for two words, customer and manager. So here they are for the glove word embeddings, which is a set of pre-trained embeddings from a broad range of text. The words seem like they might make sense broadly, you know, customer service, product client for customers and for managers, assistant management administrator. But on the other hand, I know that words that the Glassdoor reviewers use for customers and managers can be quite different from my uh, qualitative reading of the text. So here they are using the Skipgram model developed with the Glassdoor corpus. And the words here are just so much more relevant to how frontline workers write about their jobs. In the customer section, guest is how workers are sometimes asked to talk about customers. There are also common misspellings to Glassdoor that are included here, including uh, costumer and manger. Uh, for managers, many of these terms are company-specific ways of talking about managers, including STL for a store team leader, DM for department manager, or LOD for leader on duty. Um, and here are the word embeddings developed using continuous bag of words. A lot of the same words are used here. However, it looks like for a continuous bag of words, uh, similar, there are kind of more similar people words, including public and community for customers, which could be important to take into account. So in the end, I decided to use continuous bag of words embeddings. Uh, putting together representations of the words, the next step is to build a predictive model. So I use a bi-directional long short-term memory model with an attention layer. Uh, I'm not going to explain really how it works, but here are kind of the bare bones of it. So in a simple recurrent neural network, uh, you iterate over a set of words within a specific window and produce a prediction over that window. This takes account, uh, into account the context of how words are used sequ sequentially in a review. However, these models can end up forgetting information from earlier in a review. And there are two ways to take this into account. Uh, the first is a long short-term memory model, 
uh, which is a recurrent neural network that works to remember more of what was written earlier on in the text. You can also use a bidirectional model, and this is one that reads both start to finish and also finish to start. And reading both ways uh, and using information from both helps to prevent a bias from something that occurs at the beginning or at the end of the review from biasing your prediction. And finally, this attention layer helps to ensure that parts of the text that are particularly predictive of an outcome are given more attention regardless of where they appear in the text. And so after all of this, here's the predicted accuracy of these models. The models do a good but not perfect job of predicting the data. 76% uh, accuracy for the occupational orientation and 80% accuracy for the organizational orientation. And so to take into account this predictive error, I use bootstrapping in my regression models um, to revise the standard errors. So here's a breakdown of the variables that enter into my regression models. One thing to note here is that the distribution of the codes predicted by the machine learning algorithm roughly matches what appeared in the qualitative analysis. So this gives us some face validity that the models are capturing these different orientations. Another thing to note here is that I'm running a model for the pros and the cons separately. In many ways, the Glassdoor data is flexible. Workers can write whatever they want. But the one way in which the data is structured is based on these pros and cons. And so I'm kind of preserving that distinction here. For controls, I mostly include what Glassdoor provides, whether a reviewer says they're a current employee full time or had worked in a job less than a year. In addition, I include whether the city a reviewer worked in has a population of over, over 40,000, the character length of the pros and cons reviews and whether given job titles indicate a frontline worker, middle manager, or store manager. And I also include state, year, and company fixed effects. And here are the predicted values from the regressions. What I find is that head-to-head -head workers who express an organizational orientation give more extreme ratings on Glassdoor than when workers express an occupational orientation. And what this shows is that attitudes about the management of customer service interaction can be particularly powerful for job ratings. So more than when workers are concerned about negative or positive interactions with customers, workers give higher ratings when they feel the company creates a good customer service experience and lower ratings when they feel the organization hinders this. And this supports theories of organizational support in the literature but with a better understanding of what support means to these workers, support in serving customers. So that's kind of the you know, machine learning glass door part of the analysis here. And so in this next part, we know that some workers express these organizational orientations in their written job evaluations, but that these orientations are correlated with more extreme glass door ratings. But this orientation and the intrinsic value orientation imply that workers care about their customers. And even if they don't express this explicitly in the glass door view, workers might still hold on to these attitudes. And so to investigate the presence of these underlying attitudes, I conducted a survey with support from the SHIP project, which uses Facebook to sample workers from specific employers. So while scrolling through Facebook, if you say you work at McDonald's, for instance, you might see an ad pop up on your feed offering a chance at a $500 Amazon gift card. And you just have to fill out a survey about your job. I sample workers from the same 10 employers that I included in the glass door sample. And the survey was conducted in mid-November of this year. And after multiple imputation, there are about 849 responses. So to investigate this question, I asked, how satisfied are you with how your employer treats customers? And I see this as a way to interrogate workers' attitudes about a facet of the organizational orientation that appeared in the glass door reviews. And I include this question as an independent variable in a regression with dependent variables as job satisfaction and plans to look for a new job. In addition, I'm able to control for demographic characteristics, which were missing in the glass door uh, for Corpus, like um, you know, wages and 
gender and also schedules, all of that kind of missing stuff. And finally, I'm looking here to separate the relationship between how your company treats customers and your emotional exhaustion in dealing with customers or how you're treated by customers. So I also can include control responses to other questions. It's difficult to put on a happy face for customers. How often are customers nice to you and how often are customers rude to you? So what do regression analyses show? Workers who are extremely dissatisfied with how the company treats customers are overall much less satisfied with their jobs than those who are extremely satisfied with how the company treats customers. There's over a one point difference on a five point scale of job satisfaction between those who are extremely dissatisfied with how the company treats customers and those who are extremely satisfied. Now remember, this is controlling for workers' emotional exhaustion as a result of putting on a happy face for customers. And so I think this clearly demonstrates how organizational support in the form of organizations caring about its customers impacts job satisfaction. Similarly, workers who are satisfied with uh, how their company treats its customers are more likely to stay at their own job. Again, we see a stark difference between the satisfied and the dissatisfied with those who are somewhat or extremely satisfied with how the company treats customers to be more likely to stay. So as the cluster of data suggested, satisfaction or dissatisfaction with how the company treats its customers is an important dimension of work for service workers, which has consequences on whether workers like their job and their plans to leave. And again, these effects are controlling for other important differences or other important aspects of the customer service relationship. So what does this all mean for a theoretical understanding of service workers? For one, remember that Hostile talks about these interactions in terms of alienation, alienation from the self due to the forced display of emotions at work. For these frontline workers, however, workers seem to be describing the opposite. Workers find satisfaction with their customers and are concerned about how customers are treated. These are not just passing concerns. Workers get deep feelings of intrinsic value from customers, even in low-wage service work. It's important to workers that customers are treated well. The presence of deeper meaning for low-wage frontline workers suggests that healthcare is not just a special case of this emotional labor theory. And neither are workers at specific organizations with just the right configuration of feeling rules. Deeper meaning from customers and the value in providing a positive experience are fundamental aspects of low-wage frontline work. As a result of this research, we may need to rethink the relationship between service work and alienation. One, one potential way of doing this is to think about emotional labor as one of two new characteristics of service work. On the one hand, it's true that emotional display is a new part of the work as emotional labor details. On the other hand, though, the product of the labor, the customer service interaction, is fully visible. Serving a nurse a cup of coffee and watching them smile and thank you may leave you feeling like you've done a good job and provide a visceral example of how you contribute to society. This is different than workers at an Amazon warehouse who don't have to display emotions for customers, but also don't watch a customer smile when they open a package. Second, this research shows that frontline workers want to be set up for success and want to feel like their employer cares about customers as much as they do. As my survey research shows, even controlling for the emotional exhaustion, workers like their jobs better and are less likely to leave when they feel the organization cares about this, its customers. From a cultural sociology or methodological standpoint, another thing I wanna highlight here is that we need to take seriously the disconnect between the specifics of the day-to-day -day experiences of work and what workers think about their jobs. So throughout the course of a day, workers likely experience some negative and some positive interactions with customers and likely experience a roller coaster of emotions. Written evaluations provide insight into how workers sum up these experiences for themselves. This approach can potentially go beyond customers and can be used to broaden our understanding of how workers think about their treatment of work. Uh, so right now, in terms of next steps, I'm working with a team of undergraduates here at Berkeley to code chunks of text for a set of different codes in the Glassdoor reviews. And the idea here is to have a training data set of the specific ways that frontline workers talk about 
pay, schedules, coworkers, customers, managers, and other aspects of the job. And since this data is coded in chunks, it also serves as kind of a hand-coded topic model that can be used to identify how well unsupervised models are doing at identifying job quality concerns. Uh, second, I'm making a I'm asking a series of more specific open-ended text questions regarding job quality concerns. I think there's a really interesting middle ground to be explored here, combining standard survey questions with open-ended text to identify multiple layers of variation. So in the same survey that I presented some results for here today, I asked questions about specific social relationships at work, as well as questions like, what workers think about unions and long-term career plans, for example. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for, for listening. And I'm happy to take, take questions.